Oh my god, we get a full-on 80s action flick getting ready for battle montage. I know even Rocky had a montage, but still. Okay, the spin thing was cool enough. Okay, I appreciate the feminism message of her fighting by herself at the end. So she shows him the mirror, he realizes he's having a really bad hair day, is mortified and destroyed. Okay, them crawling out of him is well done. So anyway, he's destroyed by a mirror. With supernatural things, it often gets to be really stupid and retarded like that. Why doesn't he try and kill her anyway? I mean, they're essentially sparring. There's no intensity to the fight. I love martial arts, but this was not an entertaining fight, and it's totally inappropriate in a horror movie. Um, it's Dream Master, not Wishmaster. Why would she believe in wishes? A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. Spoiler free review. This one might surprise you. I personally didn't think it was that bad. It's not a good movie. It's not a sequel that lives up to the original. None of these really are. I mean, other than the seventh movie, the only one that's genuinely good is the first one. And the seventh isn't as good as the first one either. We finally abandoned the face-palmingly stupid idea of people having abilities within their nightmares. Seriously, just say it out loud, like I just did. Abilities in their nightmares. We don't have abilities in our nightmares. We're frozen stiff in our nightmares. That's the fucking point. Anyway, after that, we now get, like we did in the first two, a specific situation where we're vulnerable, where we feel powerless. Where the first one was you could die in your sleep, the second one was you're being possessed. This one is can you protect your unborn child? I mean, even I, who have no children unborn or otherwise, can relate to that, you know, protecting the next generation. Alice returns, and this time she's pregnant. The story is a bit boxed in on account of the ending of the fourth movie, but it's still pretty good. To me, this had the most likable character since the first one. They even have moments in Bond. They're driven by real-life issues, not just stalked by a killer. If there are also some obnoxious characters in this. This is also quite creepy, especially early on. The effects are amazing. And there are a ton of them. Too many, some would say and I may be inclined to agree with them. There are several unforgettable, very disturbing and creative gags. The title screen is pretty cool. That's kind of it for the positives. Kruger is excessively goofy at times, and some of the one-liners are trying way too hard. England and Hertford, if that's how you pronounce it, that kid can act, are really the only ones delivering solid performances in this. The conclusion is odd, coming out of nowhere. Scenes get lost in their big, expensive whiz-bang, and loses the audience. We're just watching the, the fireworks. There are some amazing sequences, and very atmospheric ones. This is directed by Stephen Hopkins, who did the similarly poor sequel Predator 2, which also has way too many effects, and all the gory killings, both so much so that they got cut down just to receive the R rating. This one perhaps less so in that regard, because in this, with one or two exceptions, I did care when something bad happened to these characters. And to be fair, both of them do at times work as horror films. He also directed the pretty lousy Lost in Space, and the decent Under Suspicion. And now, number 21, spoilers. What a nice, gratuitous shower scene to open the film with. Oh no, the water! Maybe I should open the door and walk out of here. Maybe I should open the door and walk out of here. Maybe I should open the door and walk out of here. I like that you could pick out Kruger's father, although did they, did they maybe make it a little bit too obvious? And loved her waking up, and then he's there. And his disappearance was very convincing, too. Alice and her father share a nice moment at the graduation. And it worked. It wasn't sappy, I didn't think. The girl singing was genuinely creepy. Oh my god, a nun! Nothing is scarier than that! Infant Kruger is really well done and creepy. The bike thing looked quite cool, but it's right out of a fucking Spawn comic. He's finally back to killing people in their dreams again properly. I really am getting sick of these horrible parent characters.
Yeah, that totally wasn't stop motion at all. Now that Greta, honestly, who would name their kid that today, is dead, I'm liking Mark better. I mean, he's still not a good actor, but he's more likable. So I like him. So, how did they get out of the house? Oh no, I'm being turned into a member of the Blue Man Group! Honestly, the no, I don't want an abortion and the scene right after are pretty good. Not necessarily well acted, but well written. And, you know, no moralizing to the audience. It's just, it's her choice and she's making it. Oh my god, he turned into a superhero. It wasn't bad how this linked it to the mother introduced in the last movie. The line, is it just me or is she delicious, was excellent. Very disturbing. And then she turns into a china doll. Okay, the comics thing was just stupid. Of 3, 4, and 5, this is the only one where Kruger has a reason not to kill the lead. You know, her unborn baby is his portal back into the world. The walking on the ceiling bit was cool. Very reminiscent of that Saturday morning cartoon about the Addams Family. Very M.C. Escher. Okay, it is a little lame that the day is saved by the fucking fetus. This has eight nightmares in the jump to a nightmare feature. Moving on to Freddy's Dead, the final nightmare. Only it isn't, technically. Spoiler free review. So other than the fourth one, this is supposed to be the funny one, in addition to being the last one. Unfortunately, it tries a bit too hard, or at least in my opinion. The humor tends to be very silly and goofy. I mean, I will admit there was one bit that really made me laugh out loud. But other than that, it was just over the top. Freddy's no longer scary, he's just funny. He's a jester. He's a clown. Most of what he does here is to amuse us. There's absurdity and black comedy. I think the use of music is supposed to be funny too. It's definitely weird. Other than when it's trying to scare us at least. Like the first, second, and fifth, we get some likable, interesting characters with credible interpersonal relationships. The dialogue tends to be good. The acting varies a tad, but Brecken Meyer is pretty good for his debut. The appearance of Roseanne and Tom Arnold in this are thankfully fairly short. In this we join an amnesiac John Doe, seemingly the last surviving teen of Springwood. I don't know, I guess he got really busy in between movies. He comes upon this institution with a bunch of maladjusted youths. We find out more about Freddy's background, and I personally think that's the worst thing to do because it takes away the mystery, but others like it, so... And this is a conclusion to the series, but it isn't particularly satisfying. It departs from the storyline that the last three set up, and it doesn't really explain why. I mean, no, there wasn't anywhere left to go, but still, just an explanation of why we are where we are, that would be nice. That would be spoilers. Okay, so ignoring the Sergeant Schultz quality of the tagline, what the fuck does it even mean? No what about my dreams. This one opens with a quote too. They went from the Bible to Nietzsche. I guess God is dead. Okay, when she flies out of the plane and goes, Woo! Could they possibly have played that mo more up for laughs than they... Okay, so he just keeps not dying in his dreams. How the fuck did Freddy kill all the teens again? If he's this ineffective? What is with the use of music in this movie? I mean, was that Ride of the Valkyries? And then it uses rock in a scene that isn't about people enjoying themselves? This is supposed to be ironic? Disharmonic? What? I do kind of like how they cut the sound when he took the hearing aid out. Ugh, Tom Arnold and Roseanne. I could do with none of them in any movie. I could do with negative amount of them in any movie. So there are no children in Springwood whatsoever. In spite of a population of 15,000. They must be very fond of contraceptives, vasectomies, tube tying, or abortion. Okay, the map bit was fucking hilarious. That was like the one thing in this that really made me laugh. I guess just the absurdity of it, you know? The map just keeps getting bigger, he practically drowns in it, then he finally finds the one spot, you know, says, you're fucked. He wakes up. The map! Well, the map says we're fucked!